thank you. <coughs> so I'm going to convince you. Um, well, thank you. That's very hard to believe some of the things that were said. So um, that's about rational expectations. Um, here's a Chinese proverb. It's thousands of years old. The government has strategies. The people have counter strategies. Uh, that's the whole thing. <laughs> so, so I want to talk about. I want to talk about. Um, I want to talk about uh, macroeconomics and the crisis, um, and uh, during uh, in various places in the press, it's macroeconomics has been attacked since the crisis and and, and doubted, um, often by people who. Um, Aren't macroeconomists and haven't read it, and I regard that I regard that work as uh, so. People will say, uh, "Oh, we'll see a, a variety of things." Macroeconomics, modern macroeconomics, which is highly mathematical, is is uh, is wrong because it uses too much mathematics and statistics. It's hard to understand. And besides, it 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 didn't predict the crisis, didn't tell us about the crisis, and. Um, we should do something else. We should go back to some old, old macroeconomics before we started uh, using new methods. And what I want to say, my message is I, I'm an older, I'm old. I, I view this as a slander against very good young people who um, are innocent of that charge, who actually have told us many helpful things. And it's, it's this charge is a, is a sign of ignorance and a confession that people haven't read things. So my reaction to this charge is, wh where were you? And, I, I, and, I, and it be s it not just, I'm not just going to say this. I'm going to tell you some um, two or three leading parts, uh, pieces of research that, um, that guide the way <coughs> smart people, that either guide or should guide the way smart people think about the crisis. Um, and then you can tell me, and I, w and I welcome questions. Um, and I'll tell you the dates on these. So, um, so I'm going to tell you two polar models of, of the crisis. And both of these models, oh, by the way, rational expectations has come under criticism for somehow being, you know, somehow the crisis wouldn't occur if under rational expectations. Well, what I'm going to show you is that the, the leading models that we have of the crisis, useful models, all rely heavily on rational expectation. They rely on people being being smart, and they point us to, to the core of the problem. Um, okay, so I'll tell you about a couple models. Uh, one was written in 1980, publi published in 82 or 83 by Diamond and Divvig. The other was published earlier. I'm going to reverse the order by Kierkegaard and Wallace. And I, I, w I want, uh, I regard these as the two polar models of the crisis. Uh, one has been much more influential than the other. Um, it's the model that explains much of what Bernanke and the U.S. Treasury did and continue to do. And it explains much of what the ECB has started to do and is being urged to do. Um, and you can judge whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. It's, um, you know, some of the decision scientists here have taught me one of the goals of the model is to teach you how to evaluate whether decisions that are actually being made are, are being made in a credible and wise way. Okay, so that's, that's where I'm going. Okay, so here's, here's the first model. It's, it's of Diamond and Digvig, and it's a model. It's a highly rational expectations model of bank runs. It's a model of an abstract bank. Okay, so, um, so here's the idea. There's um, there's a bunch of depositors. Um, so think of yourself as a depositor. And, um, and uh, you know, there's, their model is really abstract. There's, 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 there's two or three periods in their model. And when, and when uh, you're born, you have some, you know, at the beginning, you have, s you have some deposits. You have some money that you can put, you can do something with, okay? And there's, so there's a bunch of these depositors. Now, the, what these depositors actually, um, they might or might not be hit with a liquidity shock, just like, just like you. 
if you put money in the bank, you might, there might be some reason for you to withdraw it tomorrow that you haven't even thought about when you go to an ATM. Like you might, uh, I don't know, well for me, I would go by some store where there's a fishing rod that I want to buy that I, I hadn't planned to go buy. So I have to liquidity shop. Or you might be someone who wants to leave it in kind of for a long time. So there's, there's people who are patient and are impatient and in advance you don't know who you are. So, so Diamond Divig are going to model this patience or impatience. It's a shock, and they, you know, it's abstract. But their idea is that s sometimes people want liquidity and sometimes they don't. Okay, so I might want my money right away, or I might be willing to leave it in. That's that's me. Okay, now what about what about on the other side? So what there are is there's some investment opportunities in this economy, and what you are there's. There's kind of there's kind of ones that don't require m much patience. There's one period, and there's some you got to leave them in for a while. Um, so diamond divvy just because they can do simple math, they just have those two periods. So for if you leave the money in for a long time, the project matures and you get a high payoff. But if you prematurely liquidate it some of the value vanishes. Does that ring true or not? You ever built anything? <laughs> you know, or, okay, so, that, so, so that's the vision. Okay, so there's these, there's these investment projects that are out there, and they're, they're like, the good ones are long term, okay. So now, now here's the deal. The economies are ranged, so there, there's large numbers of people. And ex ante, they're all identical. Um, so the deal is, if there was a bank that you set up, and and it turned out that, you know, while you and I might not know when our liquidity f shock is going to hit, you know, there's going to be a law of large numbers. So the population as a whole, we could know it. So a certain fraction, they're going to be hit by a liquidity shock. So it turns out in this environment, you could set up a bank that would do the following. It would, um, it would accept people's deposits. It would invest a lot of stuff long, um, or some stuff short, but a lot of stuff long. And then um, um, what would happen is, see, it would be an insurance scheme because ex ante, I don't know whether I'm one of these guys who's going to be impatient or patient. So the bank's a big insurance scheme where we all get together and we pool our risk about whether we're going to be patient or impatient, whether we're going to be hit by this liquidity shock. And, and the bank's this institution is that it, it says that if, you, if you're hit by, if you're authentic, if you want to withdraw soon, do it. So you write down, if you're a game theorist, Diamond Divig wrote down the equilibrium of this. And there's, there's one equilibrium which is great. And it goes like this. Um, people put their deposits in. Um, what the bank does is it invests a substantial fraction of its deposits in long stuff. When, when people who are truly hit by the liquidity shock come to the bank, um, they can withdraw. And they, they even get interest on their deposits. And then the people who are truly not hit by the tr liquidity track, they're patient and, and they get these higher returns. So what the, what the bank's doing is it's, it's, it's a risk sharing arrangement um, that's facilitating uh, the transform, it's, genera it's creating liquidity. It's taking these, these projects that are really long and it's, it's by this, these deposits, it's uh, providing insurance against liquidity shocks. So it's, a, it's actually a liquidity provider and, it, and it, works like a, it works like a charm in that equilibrium. But the problem is there are other equilibria. And these other equilibria are all supported by rational expectations. So here's the deal. Um, this bank has a particular kind of contract um, and the banking contract, you, you can kind of ask, what happens if not just the people who are hit by the liquidity shock go to the bank, 
but some of the people who weren't hit by the liquidity shock go to the bank. Just what would happen? What would be happening is the bank wouldn't have enough to pay you out, to pay out. It would have to liquidate and some of the value would have evaporated. So what does the bank do? Is it does a first come, first serve thing. If you get to the bank in time, you get what it promised. If you're late, you get nothing. So now what happens is, okay, I am not hit by a liquidity shock and I'm, I'm patient, but I see Zaki go to, go to the bank. And I kind of, I just kind of see him. Now, I don't know whether he's hit by a liquidity shock, but he doesn't look to me like he was hit by a liquidity shock. So he's going to the bank. Um, actually, he wasn't really going to the bank. He was going nearby the bank. Uh, he sees me, seeing him go to the bank. He thinks I'm going to the bank prematurely. He knows about this first come. He goes to the bank. We all go to the bank, and there's a run. And that's in equilibrium. And it's a bad outcome. Um, and uh, so, so the situation is this banking arrangement where there's this, liqui this liquidity, trans there's this maturity transformation that banks do. Banks always do this. And not only do banks do it, almost every financial intermediary does it. A money market mutual fund does it. An insurance company does it. Hedge funds do it. So you don't have B-A-N-K written on your forehead. Anything that's a maturity transformer is a Diamond Divig bank. Okay. So here's what Diamond Divig showed. This is, a, this is a model with multiple equilibria, one of which is good, many of which are bad. And they're characterized by runs, rational expectations runs. Okay, th now here's the next thing that they, they showed. There's a solution. If, the gov if there's a government, an outside agent, that, cost, that, that says that it will insure deposits, that if there's, a, if there's anything like a run, it will insure deposits and it will pay them off at full value. It will inject resources. Then it turns out it kills off all the bad equilibria. It kills off all the runs. And the government will have to do, uh, put in the money. Never. Only off the equilibrium path will it have to put in the money. So this is the model. The Diamond Divig model predicts that the solution to preventing bank runs is to have the government offer positive insurance and it will cost the government nothing. So deposit insurance works like a cure. And this model was written in 1982. Deposit insurance is something that both Milton Friedman and James Tobin, who disagreed with each other on many things, they thought deposit insurance was great for these reasons. They thought it killed runs. I'm, I'm going to argue that, um, we'll see, that Ben Bernanke is terribly influenced by this model because in 2008, he extended deposit insurance to many institutions that weren't entitled to it, like AIG, all sorts of hedge funds, money market mutual funds. And, and you could say, why did he do that? It was extra legal uh, because he took the Diamond Divig model seriously. And he thought by extending this deposit insurance, it would be costless to the government ultimately, and it would, it would shut down the runs. Um, so I submit that that model is terribly influential. And if you, if you look at what the ECB has been doing, um, just try to figure out what the logic, um, where they <coughs> say things and we'll do whatever it takes, and then they cross their fingers and hope it's not going to cost anything. Um, okay. So if you read the Diamond Divig po uh, model paper, it's a very scholarly paper. Um, at the end of the paper, they say, um, okay, this is a model. It has these features, and it says, uh, we, omitted, we omitted one feature that we think may be important and you better take this into account. And they said there's another, we admitted something called moral hazard. We assume that the existence of this deposit insurance had no effects on the investments that the bank would undertake. That's hardwired in, that's what they said. They said we recommend you go read another paper that was written in 1978, published in 78, by two people of my friends, Neil Wallace and Jack Kerrigan. Um, it was published in the Journal of Business. By the way, a University of Chicago journal. So I'll tell you, what, I'm now going to tell you the Carrick and Wallace um, paper. It's written in 78, um, which, which, by the way, Diamond Digvig 
tell you, go read that before you take our model too seriously. So now we go on to the second model, and it's going to be a polar model. A polar, so the, I'll tell you the punchline. The Diamond Vivid model says deposit insurance is costless, knocks out runs, it's unambiguously good, it works like a charm. But Carrick and Wallace is going to say deposit insurance is going to cause crises. It's going to be a different model. I think of the origin of the, of the Carrick and Wallace model, I'll come back to this, as, as being an Adam Smith in his, cha in his chapters on money, which are, I think about a quarter of Adam Smith's book is on money um, for various reasons, because he was trying to combat mercantilism. And mercantilism was partly a theory of trade restrictions, also a theory of money. And when in attacking mercantilism, Adam Smith had to say something about money. He said really interesting things, but that's a, that's a digression. But it leads up to this. So here's Carrick and Wallace things. And it, it's linked to, a, it's linked to a, the Bible of central bankers, a book called Lombard Street um, by Badgett. So Carrick and Wallace are going to do the following. The world is risky. They're going to do a simple mental experiment. The world is risky, and, um, but there's complete markets if you want. So every possible derivative is written, if you will. So they're going to they're gonna strip things down. So there's two states of the world can happen, A and B. They're risky. And what you can do is you can, you can, buy, you can buy claims. There's a, there's a market where you can make whatever bets you want. You can, you, can, you can buy claims contingent on event A occurring and claims contingent on event B occurring. Do you understand? And either A or B occurs. So if you want, if you want something to be risk-free, you better buy some of the claim for to A and some of the claim in B. You better buy equal amounts. That's the only way you're going to get a risk-free claim. See that? So that's the world. And now what there is is there's going to be, there's going to be. Uh, I'm going to say the following: You're a small guy, so you have to buy these claims through intermediaries called banks. So what the banks do is uh, we put in a deposit and then they buy a portfolio of claims. So what they could do is they could be um, the following. Here's the title of the bank, Sleazy Bank A. You put your deposit in A and Bank A buys zero securities contingent on B and it buys everything in A. And what that bank is going to have is its payoff is it's going to have big returns if A occurs, and nothing if B occurs. This is a risk-taking bank. Here's sleazy bank B does the opposite. Do you understand? And there's intermediaries. And now, Karen Wall said, suppose that there's a bunch of guys, maybe like you and me, and they want safe deposits. And now there's a bank that says, we're boring safety bank. Uh, we're going to buy equal amounts of A and B, and no matter what happens, you're going to get this boring, risk-free return. Okay, so Carrick and Wallace's original thing is, suppose you have no deposit insurance and no regulation, and you just have a bunch of smart consumers, some of whom want safe deposits. And the bank is an institution that su supposedly claims to provide safe deposits. What Carrick and Wallace say is what's going to happen is anybody who wants a safe financial intermediary better look at the portfolio held by the intermediary and put its deposit in one that has a safe portfolio. And what's going what's to guarantee that? Regulation? No. It's what Walter Bradgett called the preservative apprehension of the depositors. Smart depositors are going to monitor the banks. Okay, so that's, that's the initial thing. Okay, now Carrick and Wallace are going to do the following thing. They wrote this paper in the <coughs> mid-'70s when the United States was thinking of, doing, of deregulating financial intermediaries. That's when they wrote this. They didn't write it in 2010. They wrote it in 1975. Okay, so here's what they said. Now suppose there's deposit insurance. We just say there's deposit insurance. And what there is is there's going to be a government agency that is going to insure the depositors no matter what the bank makes, what the bank does. 
So now what they do is they do a simple calculation. You could teach this to, fr I do teach this to freshmen. You say, what should the bank do to maximize the value of its shareholders, of its shares? What should the bank do? So what the bank is going to do, it's going to promise its depositors a risk-free return, and then it's going to hold this other stuff. And what it's going to do is it's, it's, it's going to get profits. Its profits are going to be what its returns are <coughs> on its portfolio minus what it has to pay the depositors. You do this calculation, and what you find is the bank should become as big as possible and as risky as possible. And it will guarantee itself that eventually, if you repeat this, it will fail with probability one. And the calculation is simple. It's the bank shareholders are being they're being incentivized to gamble with the government's money. So what happens in this world is uh, deposit depositors don't care, no preservative apprehension. Why should I care? I can quote uh, my relatives. Uh, um, my bank failed, by the way. I didn't care. No preservative apprehension because deposit insurance. So what this does says is that if you what Carrick and Wallace conclude is if you have deposit insurance and you don't regulate bank portfolios, banks will have the incentive to become so big and so risky that they are predestined to fail. That's what they predict. And the conclusion of this paper is if if the United States is was going to deregulate as financial intermediaries as we as both the Republicans and the Democrats wanted to do in the late 70s, you had better reform deposit insurance and withdraw it or price it or else this was going to happen. So Kerrick and Wallace, they didn't tell you when. They can't tell you when. It's random. They can tell you eventually it will happen with probability one and you're going to pass on a bunch of losses to the government and it's in the shareholders' interest for this to happen. When the banks fail, the shareholders' value will go to zero but they still want you to do it. So that's the Carrick and Walsh model, and this is, the moral, this is moral hazard, and it says extending deposit insurance is, um, is a recipe for generating financial crisis. Now you got your two pick, Th there's your, your pick. Uh, and we have mixture models. And those models are 30 years old, and they are the leading models uh, for us to think about the financial crisis. And, um, you know, so as I learned in a, in a conference that I've been the going to run by this university, one thing you could ask is you can use these little teeny models to ask, are public officials uh, making wise decisions? And do they know what's going on? So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you um, a quote from various um, presidents. I've heard this said by various presidents of Federal Reserve Banks in the United States and by the U.S. Secretary of Treasury. He wrote, wrote it down. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. Remember the Carrick and Wallace model. What it says is bank shareholders have the incentive to become as big as possible, as risky as possible. They'll fail with probability one. And, w and what will happen then is when the bank fails, the shareholders get zero value. The depositors get paid off. The creditors get paid off. Okay, so what... <coughs> So what um, Mr. Geithner and Bernanke did they ex in the, in the uh, great financial crisis, they extended deposit insurance to many institutions and many creditors that weren't protected. They bailed them out. And what, uh, the, what uh, these various officials wrote down is they said the following thing. There was, this is no precedent this leads to no increase in moral hazard in the system because the shareholders of these institutions suffered. They flunked the Carrick and Wallace exam. The model predicts that, the model says, of course the shareholders are going to suffer. The problem is that the depositors didn't suffer. The problem is that the creditors didn't suffer. So the Carrick and Wallace model predicts that the shareholders are going to suffer. Um, but that's not the telltale sign of deposit insurance. So it's extremely disturbing to me to f find high, high officials um, failing Carrick and Wallace 101. Okay. So that's one model. 
So these two models, um, um, if you have these two models in your head and you understand these models, you can learn these two models in a couple hours. They, th <coughs> they're going to they're gonna take you to the heart of everything. Um, and then I'll tell you one, I'll tell you one, um, I'll tell you one other model. Um, this, and this goes back to Carrick and Wallace. Uh, this goes back to Adam Smith. Um, QE3. How do you think about QE3? Do you know, do you know what that is? Because um, you're going to start, oh, you don't know what QE3 is. Okay, good. <laughs> so what, uh, it's going on all over the world uh, in the United States. So what it is, it's um, the United States government, um, the Federal Reserve, um, or the Bank of Japan, um, prints money. Did you know that? Uh, like, like if you read what's on a U.S. dollar, somebody said it at lunch. It used to, the U.S. dollar used to say, um, you take this dollar in and we'll give you uh, 0.02 ounces of gold. What it says now is, in God we trust. <laughs> uh, no obligation to do anything. And I don't, know what the fr I don't know what the French money says, but it doesn't say it promises to give you gold. Um, so what the U.S. government does is it, it prints money. So what it's done is it, um, it, it doesn't spend the money. It prints money and it does open market operations. So it prints money and it buys something and it holds a portfolio. So I don't know if you know what it buys. Is, um, so we had a mortgage crisis in the United States. What it buys is mortgage-backed securities. Um, and most mortgage-backed securities now are purchased by the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve balance sheet has exploded. Um, it's tripled. Um, and every month now, the Federal Reserve is buying $85 billion of long-term treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. So they've, s they've, I don't know, they've socialized or nationalized the U.S. mortgage market. That's, that's what happened. Okay. Now, and Japan's starting to do the same thing, and there are people who are telling the ECB to do the same thing. And they call it QE3. They call it quantitative easing three. I have no idea. I guess three because they did two and then they did one earlier. But quantitative easing. Okay, so the question is what different what is this gonna do? How do you think about this? What why are they doing this? So they're doing a portfolio operation. If you if you think of what the what Fed's doing, is it's printing money, which is an IOU. And they're using it to buy some stuff, which they're keeping on the asset side of their balance sheet. That's an open market operation. You could say, what difference does that make? And how do you even go about thinking about that? <coughs> so there's a paper written on that. And it's a takeoff. It's an extension of, a, of an exper a mental experiment that Adam Smith did in The Wealth of Nations. And, and it's by my former colleague, Neil Wallace. And here's what it said. Under certain conditions, precise conditions, if you hold fiscal policy constant, that means taxes, transfers, and government expenditures, then you do an open market operation like this in risky securities or anything, it has no effect on anything. It doesn't affect prices, it doesn't affect allocations, consumption, or anything. So uh, what this says is this, this is harmless doing it, and it's harmless undoing it as long as you freeze fiscal policy. So in addition to the diamond dipping model that influences Bernanke, who's the chairman of our Fed, this model also haunts Bernanke. Because he, he gave a paper at the, uh, at the Jackson Hole Conference, which has the following structure. Um, on the way out, we can appeal to the Wallace paper to say, we can get out easily. We can dump these mortgage-backed securities, shrink the money supply, and um, everything's going to be fine. But on the way in, it did some good. And if you look at what he, he does to make that subtle distinction, it is very subtle. And just knowing this little, no, knowing this model will take you right to the heart of what that debate is. And it's a, de it's a debate that's going to be on the, uh, e it's, it's going on in the ECB. And Wallace's condition about freezing fiscal policy is really important because um, monetary policy by itself 
Um, what this tells you is monetary policy by itself is basically impotent. It's all in fiscal policy. It's in taxes, expenditures, and regulation. And that teaches you a lot. Well, then I'll just conclude the other thing. Bubbles. We had bubbles, and somehow that says something bad about rational expectations and I figured out. That's just like, where have you been? The only models that we have of bubbles are models, bubbles are rational. And our th we have theories of bubbles uh, that tell us it's, uh, they're gonna happen. Um, I hate to tell you, mo the fact that US money that says I, in God we trust is valued, that's a bubble, technically. So we have theories of bubbles. They're all rational expectations <coughs> theories. It's very hard to predict when bubbles will, will pop. We know they will, but uh, it's, there's statistical theory that tells us some things are just really hard to predict. Not only for economists or macroeconomists, but for physicists. Physicists can tell you some things about some distributions. They can't predict the individual anyway. So then finally, macroeconomics is a vital area where young people are doing um, remarkable work. So one thing is that they're leaving rational expectations. They're extending it, uh, partly taking up some work that's done here by Zaki and other people. You say, well, if people don't have um, maybe rational expectations, what do they have? How are you going to discipline their beliefs? And what kind of models of heterogeneous beliefs are you going to have? And how do you think about that? And are uh, macroeconomists, decision theorists, and microeconomists have started thinking about it, and it's extremely important because it unleashes additional ways of thinking about bubbles. It will not tell you how to predict them. Um, it may not even tell you whether they're good or bad. So I don't, so I don't think you're in the Fed. So you've heard, like you might read in the Financial Times and in the Economist that <laughs> bubbles are bad. Uh-uh. Like uh, inside the Fed, you can see documents that say bubbles are good. And the reason they're good is they, I'm not saying this, but various presidents of feds have said, they're good because what they do is they relieve certain kinds of financial frictions. <coughs> they make collateral constraints weaker. Collateral constraints kind of clutter up allocations. So there's a lot of exciting work being done by young people that are thinking hard about this. So my message is macro macroeconomics, rational expectations, has been a powerful tool for thinking about the crisis. Um, it con it'll continue to be. Any t time an event like that happens, creates new and unusual data, there's a rush of young smart people to study it. And um, that's happening now. And um, macroeconomics is a great field to go into. That's all I have to say. Professor Sargent will be pleased to see me in the role of the journalist interviewing him. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say this is a private joke, so I will explain it at the break. Um, but I'd like to thank Professor Sargent for his presentation. We will do this more formally in a few seconds. But uh, Professor Sargent has agreed to take a few questions if uh, <coughs> I'm sure you have some. And uh, I will give you a few seconds to think about your questions. So this is our colleague, Sam, Sam Aflaki from the mm -hmm. Operations Management Department. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here in, in your audience. Uh, as a researcher who does modeling work, which relies heavily on macroeconomics models, game theory, and equilibrium, and rational expectations, um, sometimes I have heard criticism of, of modeling, and, and some of them feel right uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, the models that we do sometimes go off f 
from reality. So basically what we are doing, we are creating a world uh, in our heads and we are thinking and m assuming and, and, and are not <coughs> measuring. So I read the piece about, uh, you know, the, the especially in the field of business, not, not macroeconomics, because macroeconomics has its own reflection uh, on the macro side where you have data and you test the models. But there are many mo more models especially in business and operations, where uh, testing does not happen, data does not happen. So I wanted to see what is your reflection on uh, basically clinging into modeling without, without going out and testing them, as someone who has been pioneering, always testing the assumptions and so forth. So I'd be happy to hear your thoughts about that. Okay, so... Um does this work? Okay, so my my vision is a little different. So, so a couple things, um, a couple phrases. It takes a model to beat a model. That's one thing to keep in mind. And what's what's true is that um, almost anybody you so almost if you run across somebody who says, "Oh, I make decisions in life without having a model." Um, I think you should question them about it and see whether it's really true. Um, almost, almost everybody has an implicit model when you when you do things. Um, that's true of some people I know who are who are even illiterate. Um, but my vision of what business is doing, I see like business is doing, like really, like I have some friends who work for like who quit academics because they have more challenging problems in businesses. And they're combinations of statistical and theoretical problems. I'll give you an example. Friend of, I won't tell you where it works. A big company. He does data mining. Okay, so, and so, and when I was a kid, that was a disrespectful thing, a word. Now it's a complimentary thing. And what he does is he does um, this huge data sets, and he discovers um, structures that help people. An example would be, I don't know if you do this, like I, I wrote, order a book on Amazon. And it says, uh, it pops up and it says, oh, you might be interested in the following books. And I either own the books or I buy the books they suggest. They're, they're always right. I don't know how they're doing. Or he's doing that. And he's sweeping huge amounts of data. And they're using, <coughs> they're using combinations of, uh, of uh, new developments in computer science. They're pushing it. Um, they're teaching us in academics um, how, to, how to do things. And I think I see that flow all the time. Like I see flow, practical people like in the military in World War II, they addressed a bunch of problems which um, they saw problems and attacked them. The U.S. Army and U.S. Navy that created like big fields like operations research and, uh, and various kinds of statistics which, which we live on. You know, like I do a lot of stuff called, I, I, like I, I, I did like stuff on rational expectations. I just learned some stochastic processes that Wiener and Kolmogorov figured out in World War II to <coughs> shoot down aircraft. It was a prediction theory. And they solved a bunch of problems that they had, you know, because those aircraft were flying around, they wanted to shoot them down. So, I don't know. I guess I see it differently. But No, no, I, I'm, on the same, I'm on the same page, yeah. and I just wanted to see what your thoughts are, because economic theories are supposedly more difficult than, say, physics theories, where you can design, carefully design experiments to, to basically test the predictions exactly. of those okay. theories. Okay, I was reading, actually, that's true, that's sometimes true and sometimes it's not true. So, um, because, because of this conference I was at, and some things were said, I couldn't sleep. So I made my wife not sleep. So I was explaining this, and, and we talked about this issue. Well, her father was, in uh, was an astrophysicist. He didn't get experiments. So, so lots of his data processing things were exact. It he was worse than we are because um, he really couldn't do experiments. You know, his thesis was on the red shift um, and the origin of the universe and stuff like that. He had purely observational data. And, you know, we can do... We're stuck in that situation a lot, but we have, we have two things. If you're a macroeconomist, 
Occasionally, a crazy macroeconomist gets a hold of a country like North Korea or Argentina and does an experiment. So, so we have some cross-country data of screwed up economies. So that's the astronomers don't. They don't have any screwed up stars like that. There's no North Korean stars. And another thing that we have is like decision science interacts now with experimental work. Um, you know, so L L Robert Lucas said, uh, ex you know, experiments in macro are things that you'd like done on your on your neighbors, not on you. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. I have a question for people in the audience. So, do you think? I mean, I mean, you should think about this. I'll ask you this later. Do you think deposit insurance is really great, and government should bail out everything in sight, and it's not going to cost anything? Or do you think ma moral hazard's an issue? What do you think about that? And then, if you want to think about it more, read the Dodd Frank Act, which my my government, uh, so my, my theory is the Dodd-Frank Act is a law the U.S. Congress passed. It's 850 pages. And my theory is not a single congressman who voted for that or against it read it. <laughs> is that a rational expectation then? I, I won't get into that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for, uh, for your presentation. Um, and I have a question. Um, for me, theory of rational expectation shows that many of actions taken by the government are not useful as people can adapt. In that case, there are like some ideas that government shall in fact uh, try to surprise and shock people um, by their unexpected actions trying to lead their policy. I mean, instead of saying we're going to go for a QE3, just do it out of the blue and then it will make much more effect. Do you think that it's right, and what do you think about it? Thank you. Um, okay, I'm kind of with the old Chinese proverb, and, and um, actually, if you, if you kind of think about it, So let me tell you what modern, so, so modern macroeconomists, partly informed by game theorists and decision theorists of the, of the type that this institution excels in, have kind of gone beyond um, what we did in, in the 70s in macro, where we, we treated the government often just as an exogenous thing, and then we <coughs> compared the consequences of the government doing alternative strategies. What, what people, the view now is that, well, government strategies don't emerge in a vacuum. They, they're the results of some kind of process, some kind of either economic or political process. So they're themselves to be explained. Like, and, and, and if you start doing that, um, it'll take you a long way. So they're either, so you have to think about what process did they come from? Is it some kind of political economy process? If you start thinking about, <coughs> if you in a practical way, if you start thinking about the United States government and the influence of financial institutions, um, you'll observe some things you might not want to see. Um, like you'll see a revolving door, between, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Wall Street has huge influence on, the, um, on both administrations. So the Secretary of Treasury, it doesn't matter who the administration is, somebody who recently worked for a big you know, city group or something like that. And it's true whether you're a so-called populist Democrat. So there's a, there's a lot of influence. So the people that regulate the financial institutions are partly captured by the financial institutions. So this kind of thing George Stigler used to write about. So, so, so the government itself is part, of the, is part of the whole system. And actually, this is, this is the way a game theorist would think about it. Um, <coughs> government's not outside the system. It's inside, at least in a democracy. Um, so the reason I go off on this diatribe is that government policy is rarely surprising because it actually emerges from this process. It either emerges from a process like this or, 
it comes from an ec some economist having some great or crazy new idea. Um, like you could think of, you could think of many people attribute that to Keynes at some point, saying like <coughs> maybe he had some ideas about how to use fiscal policy to improve the economy. Um, actually, if you read, if you go back and read Keynes, you'll see he was a lot more cautious than a lot of people who claim to be um, critiquing his tradition. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my colleague Thomas made fun of the marketing professors. I, I don't know why, but I'm one of them. Um, I would like to know what room um, rational expectation leave to generosity, altruism, and empathy. Whether you, can, um, whether you can accommodate that in your models or whether this is completely out of the scope of your rational expectation models. <laughs> no, so, so it, it, it's important and it accommodates it easily. So, so, um, so some of the leading models of, um, yeah, it, it goes like this. So, so here, here's a one simple way it com comes up at the beginning. Many uh, macroeconomists or growth theorists or public finance economists assume that agents live forever. Well, you could say, you know that's not true. Um, but it turns out um, if people have children and children uh, and parents care about their children and children care about them, and you write down uh, preferences, um, they quickly become preferences over um, big, long sequences. Um, so the so altruism plays a key role in that, how altruistic people are toward people close to them. But then you start talking about um, like so. So I'm working on a project now which is all about al altruism in a way, because we so an example would be we write down not of that kind. Of, I'm going to write down a what we call a Pareto problem, where I'm trying to figure out what the optimal level of taxes and transfers are in a society where there's some where you care about equality and there's some innate inequality in terms of abilities. How do you, how, what's the right, what's the efficient way to tax and transfer? And there's a huge literature on that. And I would say it's all motivated toward, toward wise altruism. And the models that I know in that all build, in, they, all, they all build in rational expectations. <coughs> Part, you see, partly, <coughs> okay, so here's, Partly, people use rational expectations because um, it's a huge economy. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a huge economical step because of the following. Suppose we have a society here, and like, look how many people are in this room. And <coughs> all of our beliefs about the future matter. If I have to keep track separately of all of our beliefs about how the system works, it just, <coughs> of course that matters, but it just gets unwieldy. So like, <coughs> the idea of Lucas and Yudas cut through that and just say <coughs> we all basically understand how the system works and then we can focus on other aspects of the system. <coughs> it's not quite right, but uh, it's, a, it's a huge s scientific simplification. <coughs> Did you have a question? Last one. The, um, there is a rise uh, in tuition fees in the United States, and um, it is said to be the next bubble. Do you think uh, it is true? Uh, it is said to be the next bubble. Do you, f according to rational expectation, do you think it is true? So it's an interesting question. So, okay, so, oh, here's another thing. Um, so I don't know, but I have a friend who um, 15 years ago wrote down a paper about how to ec how econometrically do a test for bubbles. And it's subtle, it's subtle. So you can, you can, okay, so you're worried about bubbles. Um, you know, what's a, so what's a bubble? It's a, it's, so what, here's what a bubble looks like. It goes, it goes like this, and if it's a bubble, it's gonna pop. 
the fact that it's going up so uh, up so fast, that's compensating you for the probability that's going <coughs> to the the probability that's going to pop is connected to the fact that it's going up so fast. Okay, so now, you know, so if you're kind of a naive, you know, if you kind of think how you would be a statistician, you know, a, a real stock price goes like this, goes up and down, but every once in a while it goes up. So. So my friend's test has a way of sorting out when this when this thing is really part of a bubble. It's subtle because sometimes stocks go like this because there's news, uh, like Apple invents the a the iPhone, or whatever it was, the iPhone, <laughs> you know, I, I iPad, yeah. That <laughs> so it it turns out to be hard to identify bubbles, and actually people in the Fed try. So uh, Bernanke doesn't know how to do it, and I don't either. And then not only do they know they they don't even know whether they like them or not. I I view a big part of what the Fed's trying to do is restart a bubble. Um, because the crash of the bubble is what put all these balance sheets in in, in peril. Resuscitation of the bubble is gonna it's gonna um, it's gonna lift all people who are underwater out of water. That's my personal view. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. In uh, downgrading the United States, S&P justified the downgrade by saying that the political context in the United States had become much more unpredictable and far more toxic. I was wondering if you considered even the brightest minds, how could they formulate rational expectations when the rules of the game keep on changing and when there's really no apparent roadmap, meaning no apparent cons consistency in the landscape? Is that still a possibility? So that's, that's a great um, question. So <coughs> so yeah, so the, the, the question is about, so it's going to, <coughs> okay, so the way, I, the way I look, here's the way I look at it. I'm just going to repeat what you said. Um, <coughs> so the way some people characterize it is, in, in the United States, if you look at our current fiscal policy, they'll say it's unsustainable. Right. And that's what the Congressional Budget Office says. And, and <coughs> if you scratch your head and you can say, that's not a good word because, because unsustainable means it violates the government budget constraint, the intertemporal budget constraint. And one thing you know, I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat, you cannot violate budget constraints, and the government can't. So what you know is the budget constraint is going to be satisfied, and you know what's eventually going to happen is it's going to be sustainable. You're going to be inside that. So, wh so when they say it's unsustainable, what it really means is um, it's not credible. The, the promises that have been made in the existing laws are, aren't credible, and the promises have things like this. Um, and these are promises that were made by the second President Bush, not the first one. The first one was much more like Clinton. And the second one was much more like President Obama. President Obama has bought, you know, the vast majority of the of Bush's tax cuts. Um, he's much, he's much closer to second President Bush. He won't raise taxes on people making um, uh, more less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's most of the people in the country. Clinton and and the first President Bush raised taxes on them because they wanted to balance the budget. So. So we we have politicians who promise taxes are going to stay low. Oh, and by the way, we're going to increase entitlements and benefits are going to go up, and we're going to have a strong military, and a bunch of other promises. And they don't fit together. So what you know is some will be broken. And then, so so it, the political struggle is over uh, which ones are going to be broken. And now, if you actually read the newspapers. There's only a, a s there's n there's not probably a majority of the pro uh, politicians who even say some are going to have to be broken. It's amazing. Some actually say some are going to have to be broken, and they tell you which ones. Um, so I agree with you. It in introduces a lot of uncertainty about well, is the U.S. government going to get bigger and have bigger taxes, or are we going to get smaller and have lower taxes? And um, I I'm a bad predictor about that. 
Oh, I, I suspect something will happen in the middle, but who knows how? Uh, and who knows when? <coughs> because government, government intertemporal budget constraints, they're, they're, they're beautiful because um, there's lots of ways you can satisfy them. You can run up the debt for a while. <coughs> and you can run up the debt, and then you can default on it. Don't tell the Chinese that. So I'd like to thank Professor uh, Sargent. I'll let you do okay. <coughs> so how many of you think that um, moral hazard is no problem and deposit insurance is great and we should just bail out our every, every institution? We'll stop runs. Don't worry about moral hazard. Won't increase riskiness. Are these authentic? <laughs> okay, does anybody think moral hazard's a problem? Yeah, I do. Paul Volcker does too. Those are cheaters. Those are cheaters? <laughs> oh, it may be true. <laughs> it may be true. <laughs> no, I have savings. I want insurance. Because <laughs> then I can do lots of things. I'm a bank shareholder. I want insurance. I want you to have insurance too. <laughs> but that's the difference between economists and strategists. I'm interested in one individual performance. You're interested in welfare, which is a different matter, right? Uh, I'd like to thank <coughs> Professor Sargent for coming here. And I will tell you what our private joke on journalism is. And I think his being here is a very nice symbol of uh, where I hope we're all going. Um, you might have heard this phrase. It dates back to the 60s, but uh, there were some people in US universities who said that a lot of the research done at business schools was, in the best case, good journalism and more probably bad journalism. Mm -hmm. And I think we definitely don't want to be doing bad journalism, but I don't think we want to be doing good journalism either. What we want to be doing is actually creating an academic environment where what we try to develop is knowledge, where we develop real knowledge that we can test. And in order to do that, I think we need to establish causal relationships. We need to know what factors produce what outcomes. And I think more and more we are trying to develop this stream of thinking, this way of behaving, this way of doing research in business schools in general, but at HEC Paris in particular. And I think having Professor Sargent here is a symbol of this. Professor Sargent didn't come particularly for this event. Uh, he actually came to a workshop with Itzak. And I think <coughs> that the fact that we are organizing these kinds of workshops is definitely a sign that we as a community are moving in the right direction. And so I would like to thank Professor Sargent for supporting that evolution, that move in what I consider to be the right direction. And uh, Professor Sargent probably wondered where the heck he was coming when he came. <laughs> and I hope he will leave knowing that he has been at HEC Paris <laughs> and that it is, sorry? A heck of a place. <laughs> a heck of a place, exactly. <coughs> and uh, in particular from an academic point of view. So Professor Sargent, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Pierre-Antoine Gailly, who is the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, the Paris and Paris Region Chamber of Commerce, to actually bestow the title of Professor Honoris Cosa on Professor Sargent. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I am the most qualified person to do so because I'm not an academic. I'm more an entrepreneur, but an alumni of this school too. So I appreciate the fact that you joined the family, if I may be a little bit familiar. And also I think all of you have been more than interested, I'd say impressed, by the exchanges during your lecture and the following questions. Uh, unfortunately, we could not join the seminar, but I think the seminar was also a piece of very qualified uh, intelligence, if I may say so. So now it's the time to give you this 
it's not a diploma because a Nobel, a Nobel Prize doesn't need a diploma. It's a signal of this community, a signal from the chamber to be honored uh, by your input today and the fact that now there are relationships between a heck of a school <laughs> and maybe a very distinguished professor. That's, that's another gift to help you to write some new top papers. Thank you very much for him.